Hey there, everybody. Welcome back to the Primary Care Podcast. It is your boy, Dr. Mark List, uh, coming at you today with another episode. And before we do, though, uh, I wanted to talk uh, about something that happened uh, between me and my wife the other night. Um, you know, she said, Mark, you really have to stop all of your dad jokes. Nobody thinks they're funny. And so I asked her, well, how can I stop this addiction I have to telling dad jokes? And she said, whatever means necessary. And I said, no, it doesn't. All right, let's start the podcast. Any questions, concerns, feedback you can give at primarycarepod at gmail.com. Uh, thanks, and let's start the episode. Well, welcome back to the podcast, pod girls, pod boys, pod people. It is your boy, Dr. Mark List, coming at you with another episode of the Primary Care Podcast. Before we get into today, actually, that's what I already did in the intro. Uh, I, just kidding, we're going to get into the episode today. Um, today is a back-to-school special. Um, lots of families uh, around the country going back to school, uh, kids going back to school. And so I think it's important that we bring up a topic that is uh, near and dear to my heart because it's one of my favorite things to do, and that is to talk to families and talk to adolescents about adolescent depression and anxiety. And it, this is not a super complicated topic, right? Um, there are very few medications that are even um, approved for the under 18 uh, group. So this isn't anything that we need to like study multiple complex algorithms or anything like that, but it is something that we can have a significant impact in. And for some people, this can be, in fact, saving a life, um, especially with uh, teen depression, anxiety, and suicidality all on the increase, not only during the pandemic, but with the rise of smartphones and with the rise of teens feeling more isolated, feeling more smothered feeling um, this constant connection and never having any downtime away from their parents or away from friends or away from bullying, um, the impact, the incredibly negative impact of social media uh, on teen and adolescent health, especially in young girls, um, but even screen time in boys, all associated with an increase in anxiety and depression. And uh, the data is really scary on this. And as somebody who has uh, kids who are coming up to that very soon, um, the data is really scary, and we'll probably do a full episode on this later, uh, on, on the impact of screen time. And there are really two main things that I bludgeon over the heads of my families that come in for middle school and adolescent and high school sports physicals or, or well child checks or even regular appointments, and that is screen time usage in that age range, right? A including kind of social media use and that it's not horrible. You know, yes, there are good things about it. Yes, you know, it's part of life now, but really limiting the amount of time spent on those things. Um, and, and again, that's a whole nother podcast topic uh, by itself, uh, but then also on vaping, because those are the two things I think have the highest level of impact. But one other thing that has a high level of impact is talking about mental health, especially in preteen adolescents and in and, and, and basically high school age students. Now, again, we, I talked about the fact that there are very few FDA approved medications that we can choose from. This is not a complex algorithmic workup or process, okay? But that doesn't mean there aren't nuances to it. So for example, um, there are two SSRIs that are FDA approved for pediatric slash adolescent depression fluoxetine and escitalopram, Lexapro and Prozac, okay? And in practice, for example, um, even the, uh, you know, up-to-date, which is basically, you know, um, expert-based opinion, not guideline recommended, uh, talk about the fact that sertraline has good, um, you know, practical evidence, anecdotal evidence, um, real-life practice, but it's not recommended for first line because there are two FDA approved medications for that age range. So anything you use outside of that is going to be non FDA approved for anxiety or depression. Now, this gets into some of my favorite discussions about evidence based medicine. And that is, we know that I had this conversation with, um, with a family of mine the other day and that, there is a huge amount of placebo response in this age range 
in, in, in drug trials, right? So when you look at placebo versus the drug trials, there's not like a tremendous amount of difference in many of these studies. And, and why is that? Well, in this age range, placebo has incredible value. Doing something has incredible value. We also know that not only does taking something, taking a medicine, have incredible placebo effect power, uh, especially in mental health trials, but in these drug trials, frequent follow-ups and monitoring of PHQAs or GAD7s or adolescent GAD, uh, you know, anxiety uh, scores, uh, adolescent uh, pediatric um, PHQ9s, basically, that are modified for adolescents. These are things that the frequent follow-ups by themselves have a therapeutic effect that increase the response of patients to have, you know, resolution of their depression um, or even, you know, a, a, an incredible reduction in symptoms when it comes to depression treatments. So this is a study that I have found um, very interesting that because I love, as you guys know on this podcast, evidence-based medicine. And that is a study in 2018 that came to my attention when I was uh, researching things about number needed to treat, <clears throat> okay? And I love the number needed to treat. I love talking about it with patients, uh, with families, with other practitioners. Uh, it's it's great to analyze studies, to talk about number needs to treat. I think it allows you to kind of put things in a frame of reference about, you know, how many people are we actually going to need to treat before we see a benefit. Now, the number needed to treat is always the, you know, the inverse basically of the absolute risk reduction. So, you know, uh, you know one minus the absolute risk reduction. So if you have an absolute risk reduction of 50%, the number needed treats two, okay? When we talk about number needed treats though, that's the absolute risk reduction from drug trial, drug drug arm to placebo arm, okay? With with most drug trials, right? And that, you know, in, in some cases, let's say you had a 50% response rate, like you do in many, in many depression medication trials, 50% reduction in, you know, a 50% resolution of symptoms. Well, if you have a placebo response of 35 or 40%, okay, your number needed to treat is going to be in that 10 plus category, right? So if you have a 10% absolute risk reduction, you know, one divided, one, you know, divided by 0.1 is 10, right? So you have a number needed to treat of 10. But if you look at if you ignore that high placebo effect, though, because in in these in psychiatry, doing something usually gets the patient uh, gets gets benefit. And so, if we look at like what doing nothing means, right? What is the baseline of if we did absolutely nothing? If people were just on their own, if they didn't, if they came into the doctor's office and we said pat them on the head and said, "Okay, have a good you know, come back and see me in three to six months," the the spontaneous resolution of depression symptoms. It depends on study to study, but on average is about 10 to 15%. So then if you look at that drug trial that has a roughly 50% reduction in symptoms or a 50% resolution of symptoms compared to a 10% spontaneous resolution doing nothing, no placebo, no no follow-up visits, um, nothing like that, you're not, no intervention whatsoever, then you're looking at an absolute restriction of 40%, which, you know, by comparison, is, is a much, much lower number needed to treat, you know, two and a half. And so a number needed to treat of 2.5 is a lot easier to sell to parents and to sell to patients than a number needed to treat of 10 to see a benefit. So when we talk about number needed to treats when it comes to adolescent depression, when we look at the drug trials and see such a high placebo rate, I think that's important that we can talk to parents and use that data to our advantage in a couple different ways. Number one is I talk about how the fact of doing something, doing anything, tends to work really well, right? So even if we're doing incredibly low doses, right? In sertraline, for example, you know, typically the average adult's on like 50 milligrams to, to see any benefit. We start lower and we kind of go up. In pediatrics, you know, you can do 25 and even 12 and a half, right? And still see some placebo-like effect, right? A, a higher percentage. And then you, as you get up into the therapeutic doses, as you slowly increase, um, going, starting low and going slow can make a huge difference. Whether that's placebo effect or real effect, you're doing something to make an impact. Point two is that in this 
in this 2000, you know, 2018 study from the uh, British Journal of Psych Psychiatry, um, right, practicing evidence-based medicine, the error of high placebo response, number need to treat reconsidered is the article that I really like, um, that I mentioned a little bit here. They talk about how the fact that this, I, I mentioned this follow-up, following up frequently has therapeutic benefit, you know, with the primary care doctor, with the person altering the doses of medicines, talking about this response. And whether this is in person or now we know that virtual visits are also really effective at this, doing quick little weekly, every two week, every month, virtual visits, in-person visits has significant clinical impact. So again, doing something for the depression and anxiety has clinical value, right? Even if you're not adjusting the medicine at that dose, even if it's just a check-in, how are things going? How do you feel on the medicine? How do you feel like it's helping? Are your day-to-day -day symptoms better? Are your weekly overall feelings of well-being better? How are things going? Digging into specifics. That has incredibly high value when you start on people. There's therapeutic benefit. So again, getting back to this idea of this isn't a complex regimen, right? They're, the guidelines aren't complex here. Basically, you have SSRIs and you have CBT, right? You have psychotherapy. You have counseling. And that's all you have. But doing something, having a algorithm in your head to present to the patient, to present to the family of this is my plan. This is what we're going to do. We are going to start in, on a credibly low dose so it, you don't have any side effects and we're going to work up and you're going to notice things are improving over time. As we slowly go up, we're going to come back and I'm going to see you back in clinic or we can do a virtual visit. I'm assuming those are paid for in your area um, or you feel comfortable doing them. And then we are going to get you in to see counseling. Now, counseling is a hard sell for a lot of high schoolers, a lot of uh, preteens, adolescents, um, high schoolers aren't really good about talk therapy and, and cognitive behavioral therapy, but I think it should be encouraged and offered because the dad is pretty good on that in terms of at least in, in adults. Um, but don't be scared by that number you treat of 10, for example, or, or, you know, six, because the, in fact, number you treat of doing something is incredibly high, right? In incredibly good responses rates compared to just waiting for spontaneous resolution of symptoms. Now, why is this also, why do I like to talk about this so much? There's a great quote that I use in almost every time that I am meeting with a parent and their anxious or depressed teenager in clinic. And it's mostly, right, I'll, I'll talk to the kids and then I'll look at the parents and I'll say, we also probably need to have conversations with you and you need to be checking your own mental well-being as well during this time because and and here's the the quote that i use all the time a parent is always is only uh, sorry a parent is only as happy as their unhappiest child and this is especially true for moms but it's definitely true for dads um i can give some specific examples here but a parent is only as happy as their most unhappy child. And for any parent who comes in with their child, who is depressed, who is withdrawn, who is maybe experimenting with drug use, is struggling with friends at school, is struggling with bullying, is struggling with online social media stuff, is, is withdrawing, is having personality changes, is suicidal or threatening to hurt themselves or is cutting, those parents are undergoing an incredible amount of stress. And and not only does, you know, mental health issues run in families, but this absolutely impacts the mental health of the whole family. And as, as primary care practitioners, you're oftentimes not just the the pediatric, you're, you're not just a pediatrician, right? You're also taking care of the adults in many, many cases, or at least in my world. I'm also dad's doc and mom's doc as I am the teenager's doc. And Checking the pulse of the, not at literally checking the pulse, but theoretically or figuratively checking the pulse of the parent bringing the child in and letting them know like, hey, you and I might be needing to have a conversation, you know, you know, and, and don't be afraid to reach out as you're dealing with your own child's issues because that's really valuable. But it's also valuable for the parent to see that not only do you care, you're not just shipping them off to an adolescent psychiatrist or pediatric psychiatrist, 
but it's something that you can treat. You can start treatment. You can, you can do all of these things and do it very well and have significant impact instead of waiting for referral time or even not being in an area where there's, you know, a referral or a massive wait time. You can have impact by recommending psychotherapy, by recommending medication treatment options, or at least trials of medications, knowing that for 50% of kids, it might not help, but that number needed to treat is very low. And at the doses that you need to actually have clinical value, there's probably very little side effects. And knowing that we can make changes if needed because we have a couple of different options. And knowing that it's really simple. We're not talking about, you know, antipsychotic medications. We're not talking about, you know, benzos. We're not talking about things like that. We're just talking SSRIs. We're just talking about psychotherapy. We're talking about a, a demonstrated improvement overall, a low number needed to treat compared to doing nothing, not compared to placebo, but compared to doing nothing. And even if there is high placebo effects in what we're doing, we're going to get value. You know, and remember, always check the temperature of the parent in the room. Parent is only as happy as their most unhappy child. And have these conversations right away. Again, we're only going to be seeing more as the pandemic marches on, as we're back in school time. Um, Now is the time where we'll see an increase in this. And feel free to be or feel feel empowered knowing that you are equipped to deal with this. You are able to handle this very easily in a very stepwise manner. If you have resistant depression, if you have super high risk patients that aren't responding to the normal FDA and normal SSRI kind of you know approaches and you need to get specialists involved, sure, then you can punt, but you know, 90% of these cases can be handled, 95% of these cases can be handled by primary care, and that's you and me um, out in our community. So um, this has been Dr. Mark List, uh, tuning in. Uh, th- sorry, thanks for tuning in for another episode of the Primary Care Podcast. Reminder, you don't need to stay up all night to stay up to date. Thanks, and have a great and blessed week. Uh, see you next week.